By the end of this video, you will understand what a reverse proxy is, when and why you should be using a reverse proxy, and how you can implement a reverse proxy in .NET using YARP. I'm going to cover everything step by step, so let's dive in. So let's start by drawing some boxes. I'm going to first represent some sort of client application trying to reach our web server. Now they're going to do this through the internet. So let me update this to make it obvious. So the client sends a request through the internet to our backend application. Now let's say we don't have a simple application. Let's say we have a couple of microservices, for example, the users service, let's color it in red. Then we have another component, let's say in green, this can be the product service. And let's have one more component in blue, for example, or let's say yellow, and this is going to be the sales service. So for the client application to be able to use our system, they would need to know all of the services that we have on the backend and how to send our respective request to each of these services. So I'm going to depict this without a reverse proxy first. And this introduces some unnecessary burden on your client application. It now has to know the addresses of your services, how to send a request to each of these services. And we don't really want this to be the responsibility of the client application. Also, what if we have multiple instances of some service, let's say the sales service, because it has to handle a lot of incoming requests. So we decide to scale it out. We can't expect the client application to have to handle all of this, which is why we introduce an additional component called a reverse proxy. Now it has a bunch of benefits. Let me add it here. So this is a diagram for a load balancer. I'm going to just rename this to reverse proxy. So how does this change our architecture? Well, now the reverse proxy becomes the single point of entry into our system and all incoming requests go through the reverse proxy. So the clients now only need to know about one component in our system, the reverse proxy, and I'm going to use YARP to implement this. And on the backend, I'm going to use .NET 9 for all of the other applications. So I said that using a reverse proxy has a bunch of benefits. Well, what are they? So let's try to list them out. One benefit is having a centralized entry point. So now our client applications only need to know what is the address where they can access our system and this address represents the reverse proxy they don't need to know what are the downstream services and this can be useful for security we reduce the attack surface because we hide the information of how many services we have inside of our system another thing we can do is hide all of the services in some sort of virtual network and you will often see this used in the cloud where you deploy your application servers to a private network where they can only talk to each other, but they are not accessible to the outside world. The only entry point into this private network is the reverse proxy. So this in turn can improve the security of our system. So let me list that as another bullet point. I'm going to say improved system security. Another thing we can do using a reverse proxy is load balancing. These terms are often used interchangeably. You're going to hear the term load balancer quite a lot. It's basically a reverse proxy that distributes requests between multiple downstream servers. So let me illustrate that with an example. Let's say we have three instances of the user service, the reverse proxy is going to use some sort of load balancing algorithm, let's say round robin, to determine which of the instances is going to handle a particular request. Another thing we can handle and should handle on the reverse proxy is authentication of any incoming request, where if we encounter an unauthenticated request, to on the reverse proxy, we can just reject it without having to pass it down to the downstream service. We can also couple this with TLS termination, where we are only using HTTPS in the public facing APIs, the reverse proxy, and we can just use simple HTTP inside of the private network. Another thing we can implement on the reverse proxy is rate limiting. And an interesting thing most people kind of overlook is that a reverse proxy or a single entry point gives you a bit better observability into your system. So let's say we're using OpenTelemetry and we're tracking a request from the client application to the backend. With a reverse proxy, it's a bit easier to see what are all of the touch points for a particular request. If we have communication between the services, it's easier to view them in the broader spectrum. This isn't too big of an advantage, it's just something that I wanted to highlight. So that's basically what a reverse proxy does. Now, how do we implement 
implement this inside of our .NET applications? Well, I mentioned YARP already. And what is it? It's a simple library that you can integrate into an ASP.NET Core application to turn it into a reverse proxy. And it's really beautiful how easy it is to set up. So let me jump into the code and show you. So here's the application I'm going to use. I have three downstream services, the user's API, the sales API, and the product's API. Each of them implement a couple of CRUD endpoints, and they all have a database. I'm using Docker Compose for orchestration, so you can see I have some configuration for the Gateway API or the reverse proxy, the user's API, the sales API, their respective databases, and I'm also spinning up an instance of the Aspire dashboard so that we can observe some telemetry data. Now, when it comes to the initial setup that I added in this Gateway API project, I did configure open telemetry for metrics, tracing, and log. I'm also adding Swagger and HTTP client. So then what is the next thing that we need? Well, as I said, I want to use YARP. This is short for yet another reverse proxy, and you just have to install the YARP NuGet package. The package is called YARP reverse proxy, and I'm going to use the latest version, which at the time of recording this video is 2.3.0. So then what is the next thing we have to do? So let me start here. I'm going to say builder services and we have to say add reverse proxy. This is going to configure any relevant services with the dependency injection container. And then we need to load the reverse proxy configuration. I'm going to pull this from my application settings. And by default, this should live in a configuration section called reverse proxy. So that's one piece of the puzzle. You configure some services and you pull the reverse proxy config. Then the next thing is you need to map the reverse proxy from your application and you just say map reverse proxy and that's it. You have a fully working reverse proxy. Granted, you have the configuration in place. So what do we need in the config? I'll go to my app settings JSON and I'm going to define a reverse proxy section. You can see I'm getting some IntelliSense here where I need to define two sections. One is called the routes and the other is called the clusters. So I'm going to accept the AI suggestion just to make this a bit simpler. And now I'll explain what each section represents. The clusters is your downstream servers, our services from the diagram, if you recall, the user's API, the sales API, the product's API. So let me give the cluster a respective name. I'll call the first one the user's cluster or the destinations. I'm going to say destination one and then which downstream address should I use? Well, I'm going to use the ones that I have in Docker. This is using HTTP and the port is 5100 for the user's API. You can check this in the Docker Compose YAML file. So user's API, this is the internal name and then 5100 is the HTTP port. So this is what I'm going to reference in the user's cluster. Then in the routes, I also want to configure the user's route or routes. The cluster ID needs to match the ID here that I defined for the cluster, I need to configure how I match any requests that belong to the user's cluster. You can be granular here and define all of the routes one by one. And this is going to produce a bit of a cleaner setup. But in this case, I'm going to use a user's prefix with a catch all wildcard. And then I can do a transform and I want to transform the request from this route containing a user's prefix into whatever falls into the catch all pattern. So then I'm going to copy this and also apply it to the other downstream services that I have. So let me define the products cluster and the sales cluster. Now, of course, I need to update the addresses for the products API. This is going to be port 5300. So let me use that. And for the sales API, this is going to be port 5200. I need to do the same thing in the routes. So let me copy that as well. So we have the products route and the sales route. I have to match them to the respective clusters. So I'm going to update the cluster ID and then let's update the routes to also target products and then sales. So with this setup in place, I've configured my reverse proxy with three downstream servers and the respective routing logic. If I want to have multiple instances of my downstream servers, I can define them with additional destinations. So this can be destination two. And let's say we have another user's API running on port 5500. So then I can configure a load balancing policy on the cluster level. And I have a couple of them to choose from, let's say least requests, random, round robin or power of two choices for example this is how you can set up load balancing i'm going to omit this because i only have one instance now i did mention for example authentication and rate limiting you can set an authorization policy 
on the route level and configure a policy name, let's say authenticated, and this will require any incoming requests to contain a valid access token or a cookie. And you can also configure the rate limiter policy with the policy name, let's say fixed 100. And for example, this allows 100 requests per minute on each endpoint. This is just a demo. I'm not going to be using these features. So with this in place, I should be able to start my application. And if I jump into Postman, I can, for example, send a request to the proxy address, which is on localhost 5000. I'll specify the route prefix of sales and the endpoint URI is then sales with the user ID as a query parameter. So if I send this, you can see I'm getting back a response because I have a sale for a user with the ID of one. And in this sale, they bought the product with the ID of one. So just a dummy example. But if we take a look at the logs in Docker Compose, you can see the logs from Yarp. And an even better way to observe this is through the Aspire dashboard. If you go into the logs here, you can find the login link right here, which contains a login token. So I'm going to click this. And now we can see the structured logs from all of our applications. So we have the gateway API and the free downstream services. Let me go into the traces. And then here's the request to our sales endpoint. And you can see how the request lands on the gateway API. Then the gateway sends a get request to the sales API, which finally communicates with the data database does a select statement and returns the results back through the gateway. If you want to grab the complete source code for this example, you can do that by joining my community. It's going to be right below in the video description. Now, let me show you one more example of what we can do with YARP. I want to demo request aggregation, which you can do in a reverse proxy. Now, this is just going to be a quick and dirty implementation without any service discovery or proper setup because Yarp doesn't natively support request aggregation, but I think it's a fun pattern, so I want to show it. So imagine a use case where the client needs to call several downstream services to combine a couple of responses and then render them on the UI. Well, it would be more efficient to send one request to the reverse proxy and have the proxy send the requests downstream aggregate the responses and return that to the client. So that's what I'm trying to mimic here. Let's say we have a dashboard endpoint on the reverse proxy. So you can do this with YARP, you can define arbitrary endpoints. And inside I'm going to send a downstream request to the user's endpoint and the sales endpoint to fetch the sales for this user. I'm actually initializing these as tasks and then I'm waiting until they're all complete and finally returning the results. And in this case, it's safe to access the result property because we awaited for the task to complete. If they didn't, we would get an exception, which we should handle, but I'm only testing out the happy path. So let me start the application again, and I should be able to send a request to the dashboard endpoint and specify my user ID. And you can see I get back a response containing the user and the user's sales. So the request aggregation definitely works. Now let's also take a look what happens in the distributed traces. You can see the latest trace here to the dashboard endpoint. And you can see we have our initial request to the dashboard endpoint, and then two requests going out in parallel to the user's API and the sales API. And after they both complete, we stitch together the responses and return that as an aggregate response from the reverse proxy. So this is a nice little use case that you might find interesting when using YARP as a reverse proxy. I'm sure there is a better way to standardize this with some middleware and a couple of abstractions, but I just wanted to show you a quick and simple example. So I hope you now understand what a reverse proxy is and why and when you should use it. If you still have any questions, feel free to drop them in the comments below this video. If you want to see how you can implement a load balancer with YARP, I recommend watching this video next. Make sure to smash the like button below this video. Check out my courses if you want to improve your software architecture skills. And until next time, stay awesome.